this week on Waterways, Florida Bay Fishing, and Key West Solid Waste Removal. Florida Bay, pastel blues and greens, sand-colored banks, the sky melts into the water. Welcome to the Flats Fisherman's Paradise. The Florida Keys is, is, has such close access to one of the largest estuaries in the United States, which is Florida Bay. In the Keys and Florida Bay, you can you have so much access to such a variety of species um, from bonefish and permit and tarpon to snook and redfish and trout in the backcountry. Um, you have such an incredible ecosystem where you have the last saltwater crocodiles, you have rosette spoonbills, you have all kinds of migratory bird species that come down into Florida Bay in the winter. So it's not all about fishing. It's about the fact that it's such a unique environment to take people. With creatures of every size, color, and variety, and an expanse of sky and water that seem to go on forever, Florida Bay lures visitors from around the state and around the world. While most of Florida Bay falls within the protective boundary of Everglades National Park, it takes more than a line on a paper and a handful of rangers to protect this beautiful part of our heritage. Some of Florida Bay's best stewards have always been the men and women who work and play access and see places that they normally don't see because the backcountry of Florida and up into the Everglades is a relatively intimidating place to go if you don't have a working knowledge of the area. For some, being a guide is also about being a caretaker. Until recently, Florida Bay was a place that didn't seem to need protecting. The bounty of the bay seemed endless. There seemed to be enough fish for everyone. Whenever my senior guides fished in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, it basically appeared to them as an unlimited resource. There were 10 boats on the water on any given day, and there was an abundance of places to fish. To many recreational anglers and fishing guides, the problem seemed clear. Too many anglers with sophisticated equipment taking too many fish. Redfish especially were suffering. 
In the 1980s, a New Orleans chef created a popular recipe for blackened redfish. The recipe spread from coast to coast. This was bad news for a fish that was getting rarer in coastal waters in the 1970s. I would say in the, in the 70s, by the mid 70s, late 70s, it was it was virtually impossible to go out and have a decent day polling on the flats, looking for redfish, looking for snook, uh, and finding enough fish to make a, a day of fishing worthwhile. Something had to give. So anglers like Sandy Moret got together and formed the Everglades Protection Association, a group of conservation-minded anglers whose goal was to protect Everglades National Park and Florida Bay. Their goal was to save fish, even if it meant limiting the take of every angler on the water. Government officials listened. In 1988, the redfish fishery was closed, and when it reopened, redfish could be taken as a game fish only and only one fish per angler per day. The angler's crowning achievement came a few years later. In 1994, voters in the state of Florida overwhelmingly supported a constitutional amendment that banned gill nets in all state waters. Before the net bans in, in Florida Bay, there were very few days when you could go out and pole a flat and see redfish or see snook. After the net ban, after they closed redfish and snook and no longer made those commercial species, put them on the game species list, they started to rebound. Mother Nature is extremely resilient. Leave it alone for a while, it will rebound. But the bay wasn't left alone for long. In the 1990s, a new threat appeared. Between the 1980s and 1990s, the registration of small boats in Florida increased by 40%. In some counties in South Florida, it doubled. Many of these boaters headed to Florida Bay to fish its increasingly popular waters. But Florida Bay is not a place for the beginning boater. I mean, the Florida Bay is not a deep lake that, that has a shoreline around the edge of it. It's a, it's a series of uh, uh, shallow areas and some of it has got rock. Some of the bottom in Florida Bay and in the lower keys especially is like concrete. I would say the average depth of Florida Bay is three to four feet which is relatively deep but there are literally miles and miles and miles of flats that surround all these deep areas with only a few ways to get through and the flats may be six to three inches deep. What I see the novice boater doing is just assuming that if there's water there, they can run their boat. Whether they have a shallow draft boat or a deep draft boat, they figure that if they've got enough horsepower, they can get through anything. Florida Bay is a maze of mud banks. One mangrove key looks like the next. It is impossible to find a direct route anywhere. Boaters must take a roundabout course to get from one end of the bay to the other. It is a place where many get lost and run aground. There's very few places in Florida Bay where you can go from point A to point B without having to go to point C and D to get through designated channels where there's um, places through the flat. Even veteran guides are careful when navigating stretches of flats in the backcountry. When inexperienced boaters take on the mazes of Florida Bay, they often make mistakes, wreaking havoc on fish and seagrass communities. Most novice boaters are completely unaware of the world that lurks below them. The introduction of an inexpensive global positioning system, or GPS, in the mid-1990s is the cause of many of these problems. The GPS gives boaters the confidence they need to get in trouble just enough know-how to be dangerous. Five years ago, around the invent of the GPS, there was quite a few less boaters on the water in Everglades National Park and in the Everglades because it was so intimidating. With the invent of GPS and shallow running boats, everyone feels like they can go anywhere, which is not the case. In fact, most boaters that run aground have a GPS on board. A GPS is no substitute for a chart, 
compass, polarized sunglasses, and lots of caution. Inexperienced boaters are taking a toll on the bay. Boaters have damaged almost 10,000 acres of seagrass, prime habitat for fish, lobster, and shrimp. And irresponsible boating is not only tearing up the fish habitat, it may also be changing fish behavior. The fish are changing their habits. Bonefish tend to not want to stay on the flats as long as they used to and tail and feed. Tarpon tend to want to stay in deeper water and not roll and show themselves as much due to the pressure. Areas that once used to hold a lot of fish are now areas that people use strictly for traveling. So they run over the fish's house enough times the fish are going to leave and set up residence in another area. It isn't only poor navigation that is putting a strain on the fish. Guides like Tad think that many anglers need to practice a gentler form of catch and release. Catch and release doesn't mean you catch a fish, drag him in the boat, take pictures of him for five minutes, turn him loose back in the water, and that's a successful catch and release. That fish shouldn't leave the water for more than two to three seconds, whatever it takes for you to snap a picture of that fish. Merely returning a fish to the water does not guarantee its survival. The thrashing and splashing that follow the fish's arrival at the boat announce its presence to predators. A fish that has just been fighting for 30 minutes and then suffocating in the open air makes easy prey. Need some help? Yeah, I try not to touch them much and get the slime off of them, nice which fish. protects them. Adios, baby. <laughs> Despite the hazards, many anglers and boaters still want to be their own pilot. Seasoned Florida Bay captains have these tips. Be realistic about the limits of your own knowledge. If you have a boat that drafts two feet or more, think seriously before going into the bay. This is a place for shallow draft vessels. Most importantly, listen to the people that know the bay. If, if someone wants to learn their way around, they need a chart. They need a good navigational chart. They need to learn a little bit about the tides. We don't have a lot of tide here, but we don't have a lot of water depth either, so it doesn't take a lot of tide to do, to do you in. And either a compass or a GPS, Polaroid glasses, and if you don't know, don't go. And if you do find yourself in unfamiliar areas, go slowly. Give other boaters plenty of room. But you see somebody standing on the back of a boat with a push pole in his hand, uh, and you run by a hundred yards from him, or you cut through a quarter of a mile in front of him because you're going somewhere, you may have just destroyed his day of fishing. You may have just destroyed it for a client that came down who's paying a lot of money to go out fishing, and he's paying for a hotel room and you may have just like wiped out a two hour section of that guy's day. And it might be the only good section he had that day, so. Guides and local anglers are struggling with the problems caused by recreational boaters. They have entered once again into the public policy debate. I think we need, very badly, we need a boating license to operate a boat. Uh, there should be a requirement. Uh, that you have to take a test, you have to have a written test, you should have to have an actual driver's test. There should be a fee for this, if, if it need be. Um, and uh, to operate it in the park, you should have to have a park test as well. There are no plans at this time for a license, but the park is working closely with local guides and anglers and listening intently to what they propose. I would prefer that anyone operating a vessel in the backcountry of Florida Bay, in the shallows of the Keys and the Sanctuary, have to attend a mandatory class on how to protect the environment. Or go with a guide. Go with a paid, hired professional that knows their way around the bay. What guides hope to achieve is simple. They want to continue doing what they love in the most beautiful places on Earth. This is the only Florida Bay and Florida Keys that we have. Those of us that live here and fish here and make our living on, this waters, on these waters 
we don't have any other place to go. This is the only place where we can target many species 365 days a year. Some guides see their work not only as a job, but as their duty. If we are to protect Florida Bay, we will need as many of these passionate professionals as possible. There are people that fish for a paycheck, and there's people that fish for a living. The people that fish for a living are much more concerned about our future and what we're going to have left and what we're leaving for generations that are to come that are going to be guides as well. Hear their field operatives at least twice per week. They are essential to the functioning of those remote tropical islands, and you probably know nothing about them. Even more likely, you are unaware of what happens to what you give them. It's important for everybody to worry about what happens to your trash. Historically, what most people do, and everybody's guilty of it, is they put it out on the curb on Monday morning, it's gone, they never think about it again. They don't care where it goes, they don't care what happened to it, they paid their garbage bill, it disappeared. Until 1991, the trash generated in Key West was put into the landfill on the north end of Stock Island, commonly referred to as Mount Trashmore. New state regulations requiring all landfills to have watertight lining forced the closure. Instead, the heap is covered so that no rain can seep through the trash into the nearshore waters. Since then, all trash has been trucked out of the Keys. It's important that we worry about it because, especially here in the Keys, we have no land. We have very limited use here. We're always going to have to send everything out of the Keys, way up the Keys. Essentially, what happens with all unrecycled P.U.S. trash is that it is incinerated at the southernmost waste to energy facility. The energy created is used for operations and the remaining is sold to the city electric system, helping to defray trash removal costs. Waste energy process is uh, very typical these days for waste handling systems in the United States. It's more prevalent in Europe and is still the major way of handling trash in Europe. It was technology that came from Germany. 60s and 70s. Uh, modern waste energy facilities, a pretty complicated piece of equipment. It's well accepted as a means of handling solid waste systems. In 2002, the southernmost waste to energy facility incinerated 56,000 tons of rubbish. Key West garbage has a very unique makeup, mainly because it has a very unique business structure. Key West doesn't have the heavy industrial trash that some mainland cities have. What we have is bars and restaurants and guest houses. So what we get a lot of is exactly that, a lot of beer bottles, a lot of heavy food stuff, a lot of very moist trash. We have a lot of horticulture in Key West. Massive amounts of yard waste. Yard waste represents close to 8% of our gross um, tonnage that we process every year here. And that's in extremely high numbers compared to other communities. Key West is a tropical paradise, a veritable jungle. The withered palm branches and sea grape leaves are added to the trash for incineration. For the material that is innocuous to the environment, it is an unfortunate burden to the system. Essentially from the time you put out a bit of trash, it gets picked up by a roadside contractor, brought to the facility, put into a tipping pit. The tipping pit, a large overhead crane picks it up and drops it into a waste energy incinerator, water wall boiler. It's incinerated and combusted at high temperature and that generates steam and electricity from the process. The, uh, res the residual ashes are uh, collected and sifted. Metals are extracted from them for recycling. The ash is then trucked up to a certified landfill in Pompano Beach. Another byproduct of the incinerated trash is emissions that are released into the atmosphere. This is changing as well. Due to new required upgrades, the citizens of Key West will soon have to make some difficult decisions. The waste energy facility needs to be upgraded with advanced pollution control equipment by December of 2005 in order to stay in compliance with its DEP permits. It's a large capital expenditure to do that, somewhere around $4 million. 
and we're trying to make a decision now whether we want to invest the money and to waste the energy and keep the plant for another 15 years or so or whether we want to tear it down and try another means of handling waste. The upgraded pollution control system will reduce emissions by 90 percent. However, this may not be the only option. An alternate proposal being considered right now is the building of a state-of-the-art transfer station at the same site. Whatever the technology chosen, one thing is essential. The people of Key West should reduce the amount of trash they produce. You would think in the most pristine environment in South Florida that our people would be more interested and the citizens would be more interested in recycling, but just, just the opposite is true. We recycle less per capita in almost any city in the entire state currently. In 2002, 9.5% of the trash under Key West's control was recycled. 9.5%. The year before, the people of Seattle, Washington recycled 48%. Increased efforts to recycle trash will greatly help reduce negative impacts on the environment. But it is equally important to buy recycled products, and for individuals to be more conscientious about the amount of trash they generate. The key to recycling isn't necessarily putting it out curbside, taking out the aluminum can, taking out the glass bottle. The key to recycling is how you buy your merchandise. Recycling programs have to start with the manufacturers and have to start with the way you buy. If you go to a store and you have a choice between buying a TV with a little tiny box and a little bit of packing or a TV with a great big box and a lot of packing, you want to buy the one with the least amount of packing. It's going to create the least amount of waste from the purchase. The power of the consumer has been proven effective in capitalist societies. Also effective is the power of knowledge. Pay attention to where your trash goes, help make ethical municipal decisions, and don't leave it to someone else. It's important that we reduce the amount of trash that we have or that we handle our trash in the most cost-effective and environmentally friendly way we can figure out. You don't necessarily want to rely on burying it in somebody else's backyard forever. It's not going to work. We're eventually going to run out of space. Look at the landfill behind us. It's 91 feet tall. It took up the entire north side of Stock Island practically. It didn't take long to do it. You have to think about the future. There is no question that our actions on the land have impacts on our waterways. As populations grow exponentially, an out of sight, out of mind mentality will be sure to create calamities that will be easy to see, but hard to watch. In regards to solid waste disposal, our civilization cannot afford to wait and see.